What's up, Believe Nation? Welcome to another YouTube Hangout. I am extremely honored to have a very special guest with me, somebody who's had a huge impact, not on just on the world, but on my life as well, the one and only Mr. Tony Robbins. Tony, welcome aboard, man. Thanks, Evan. Great to be with you. Now, uh, before getting started, I just want to express my gratitude to you. I know you've done so much for the planet, for humanity, but also for me personally, my family. Uh, this book was one that changed not just my life, but my mom's. She bought this when I was six years old. Still has oh her, phone number and her name is in here. And uh, it really touched her life. And it was one of the first books that I read that was kind of an adult book. And yeah. so I just want to thank you for the impact you've had on me personally and my family. It really meant a lot. That's very kind of you. How old are you now, may I ask? Uh, what year is it? It's 2018. I'm 38. Oh my God, since you were six. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing this a little while. Well, thank you. I'm very complimented and give my best to your mom. I will. Thank you. Uh, we're here to talk about your new book, Unshakable. And, and what I found super interesting about this, it, it kind of feels like it's your life strategies just applied to the financial markets. Yes. Uh, I, you open up the first page and it says, when you're truly unshakable, you have unwavering confidence even amidst the storm, which is what you've been teaching mindset wise forever, but now apply to the financial markets. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I think so, except it's really about the strategies of how to do that. It's not just about being confident. What makes you unshakable is that you understand the immutable patterns of the marketplace. You know, there are patterns just like seasons that come about. And what happens for people since they don't, you know, humanity transformed from basically traveling constantly from place to place. We built communities once we understood the seasons because we could know when's the right time to plant. Most people do the right thing at the wrong time. And if you do the right thing at the wrong time, you'd get no rewards whatsoever. So I, in 2008, when I saw the markets just crashing everywhere, and I was working with Paul Tudor Jones, one of the great top 10 investors in the history of the world. I've been working with him for 24 years. He warned me, showed me what was coming. And during that time, I did incredibly well. And I was trying to tell everybody what's happening. And I was so angry about the abuses that happened that put us in that place. And I thought within you know six months or a year, something will be done. And two years later, I saw this documentary it was all about you know, how the meltdown happened. And I realized nothing had changed. And so I said, you know what? I have a unique gift. I have access to some of the smartest financial minds on earth. What if I interviewed 50 of the smartest people put in a book? So I did that over five years and I did Money Master the Game, which was 675 pages. And so then I wrote this book because I knew, look, this is the longest running bull market we've had in our history now. And uh, it, we have a correction that's coming and most people make stupid mistakes in a correction that affect their whole life. And I wanted to write a book that whether you're a millennial just getting started or you are you know, a baby boomer and think you have no time left to show you how you can still win in any marketplace. And the unshakability comes from the fact of understanding facts. So, so for example, Evan, every single year we have a correction on average for the last hundred years. A correction is a change that's less than 20%, usually 10 to 20%. The average has been 14% during that time. Now, 14% drop gets people's attention. Now, you probably even remember two years ago in 2016 in January, at the worst opening in the history of the stock market for January. And we ended up having this amazing year in the end. People were freaked out. I remember they were reaching out to Davos, Ray Dalio was there and CNBC went there and said, what do we do? You know, the market's lost $2 trillion, not down 9%. And he said, pick up Tony Robbins book. I did an interview and I shared with him my strategy how to make money in any season. It's called All Seasons. And the truth of the matter is if you practice what he did, you're up 2% at that point. So I wanted to write a book that would show anybody how to go from where you are to where you want to be in the shortest time, make you unshakable, not based on enthusiasm or confidence, but based on understanding the real patterns. One other pattern, and I'll, we'll throw it back to you for your question, but 80% of those corrections, 80% never become a bear market. So the market makes money 77% of the time. That means three out of four years, you're up. That's a pretty great deal. But because of people's fear, their lack of understanding of patterns, they overreact and make dumb decisions. I mean, the market's up more than 300%, you know, since, since 2009. If you got on the worst day in 2009, you got on the day of the crash, you're up 300% today. But statistics show people's 401ks, for example, more than 30% of the people stopped putting money in back then. And two thirds of the people reduced what they put in their 401k because of the fear of what happened 10 years ago. So you got to understand that you got to be in the marketplace. What, what there's a lot of talk about control in the book. What is the one thing that you want people to understand about control? And they feel out of control. They feel they don't understand the stock market. Like, what's the one message you want to you want people to take home around control? 
I think it's uh, that you have to become an owner and not just a consumer. Mm -hmm. You have to take a percentage of what you earn, as simplistic as it sounds, and automate it so it comes off the top of what you earn. Uh, there's a gentleman that used work for UPS named Theodore, and Theodore Robinson was this guy who never made more than $14,000 a year, and yet he retired with $70 million and gave away $35 million while he was alive. How did he do it? He became an owner. His best friend said to him, listen to me, the most important thing in your life is we're going to put a wealth tax on you. He goes, a wealth tax? I make $14,000 a year. He goes, we're going to make you wealthy with this tax. It's not a government tax. It's tax for yourself. So we're going to take 20% of what you earn and put it in an investment account and let it build up. He said, I can't afford that. He goes, once it's automated, you won't notice. That's all he did that made him $70 million. So it's like people have to understand that no matter how good you are in business, we all need a second business with no employees and it takes very little time. Something that once you do your homework should take you, you know, 15 minutes to an hour twice a year to rebalance perhaps. But outside of that, that's what this is. This is setting up a business that'll make you do well. When I was, um, how old was I? When I was 20, 24 years old, 25 years old, I worked with a man named Ken Blanchard who wrote those one minute manager books. You probably remember him, Evan. Yeah. Yep. Really great guy. And he, I helped him take five strokes off his golf game and that made me God to him. <laughs> so, and then he would say, I want to return the favor. And he goes, the best advice I got growing my business was I was about to come out with my first book. And he said, a friend of mine who's very wealthy said, do not put that money in your company. Let the leads go to your company. Do not let the profits go and do not spend those profits. Put that in a separate account that nothing ever touches because your business will eat whatever resources you have. When a growing business does that. And he said, Tony, I put that aside and during the tough times, that's what made me safe. Well, I did the same thing with that in my original infomercials. That alone made me a wealthy man. So when tough times came, I could withstand it. So I see so many business owners go, yeah, but I have control of my business. Bullshit. You have influence over your business. Yes, you have more influence, but there are better entrepreneurs than you perhaps out there as well, or businesses that get greater valuations than your business will. And so your ability to grow, you want to grow your own business? I always tell people, you want to build two businesses the business you're in and the business you're becoming. And then you want to have the business that you're in and becoming and an investment business. It's really simple once you set it up. And I think everybody's got to do that if they really want to have financial freedom because look, the marketplace changes, competition changes. IBM was the head of the pack forever. And then some little kid from Microsoft comes along and buys MS-DOS for $50,000 and then leases it to them and makes himself three billion on that little move alone. He didn't even write the software, right? you know, he's doing great. And all of a sudden, you know, this little company comes along a couple of guys at Stanford called Google, you know, and Apple comes along. So there's always disruption and the disruption can be competition. It can be new technology. It can be a change in the culture. So even if you do everything right, you could lose. I want people to have a backup plan. This is the backup plan. I love it. And I want to dive deeper into some of the tactics, especially for entrepreneurs. But first I had a personal question because it relates to, to chaos and control. Yes. I love I love chaos. I love I love it when the market's out of control. It's why I love the stock market. I love entrepreneurship. I think a lot of my audience can relate to that. Yes. Where I struggle is actually internal. I hate being out of control of my body. So I've never yes. been drunk. I hate roller coasters. Never done drugs. Even <laughs> going to uh, your UPW last year, I had a hard time fully 100% committing because you lose control sometimes. And and I want to fix it because I'm coming back in November <laughs> to UPW, New York. We'll see you and, then. That's and, awesome. I, and I'm just, I'm curious about what your perspective is on that. Well, um, yeah, I, I look at control as a delusion, right? That's the first thing. It's your desire for the illusion of control that's pushing you. What you want is certainty. You want certainty you can avoid pain. You want certainty you can have pleasure. You want certainty you can have a significant and meaningful life. We all want certainty. But uh, learning ways to control what you can control is wonderful, but you can't control most things. What you can do is influence them. And so what I look at it and say is, don't give myself the delusion that I have control because then I'll feel like I've lost it at some point. I never have control. I have influence. I can influence my kids. I can't control them. I can influence myself. I can influence what happens to me financially. can't control it completely. And so I think if you give up the illusion of control, that loosens things up a little bit. But I think the second thing is, is to focus on what you can control, which is what, what you think, feel, and what you do. And if I focus on the things I can control, I'm going to feel better. I mean, all the research shows that human beings, when they feel out of control, freak out inside. And the more they feel they're in control, the greater their self-esteem. And the way to have that additional control is to say, okay, what I can control is what I do within the seasons. 
you can say I don't like gravity and step off the side here, but you're going to pay the price. There are certain things that are outside your control, but you can use gravity. I can fly a helicopter or an airplane because I understand the dynamics of how to do that. If you understand the dynamics of the marketplace, you use the marketplace. The marketplace doesn't use you. And that's why I wrote Unshakable. I want people to have no more fear. And when you start understanding some of these statistics, like what's everybody afraid of? A bear market. A bear market is when it, you know market corrects 20% or more. Over the last 80 years, they've happened about every three to five years, to give you an idea. Later years, more five years. Well, now we've gone the longest period in history without one. And yet people are still afraid. After every single bear market we've had in the history of the United States, it's led immediately into a bull market. If you remember 2008, 2009, 50% drop. In the next 12 months, it was up. the S&P was up 69%. It's almost 70%. I can show you every turn down. So when you start seeing that, it's it's immutable. It's like winter comes, but winter isn't forever. And winter is a great time to take advantage because some people freeze to death in winter. Other people ski and snowboard and get by the fire. Well, winter is when things are on sale. If somebody said to you, I got a $400,000 Ferrari that you could buy for $70,000, you'd probably grab it in a heartbeat. But if somebody takes you a stock that was $400 and it's 70 bucks, you're like, oh my God, I can't do this. You have to look at the cycles of history. And when you do it, you become unshakable. And more importantly, you become wealthy. So, so you talked about Ken Blanchard and, and selling the business and having money and investing it back into the stock market. What would you tell the startup entrepreneur who maybe is just getting started or maybe still has a full-time job and it feels like every dollar that they're making, they're just trying to build their business at the moment. They haven't cashed out yet. Should they be investing into their business? Should they still be saving some put into the market? What would you tell that person? I think you have to put something outside your business because what's the number one rule of investing that even idiots understand? Don't pull all your eggs in one basket, right? And what do 90% of entrepreneurs do? Because of the illusion of control, they go, I'm going to put all my money in my business. Don't get me wrong. It's still a great place for your money and for your time and for your energy. But you got to take a piece of what you earn and you got to bet on some other entrepreneurs and get outside yourself specifically. And if you look at, you know, somebody like Warren Buffett will tell you, you know, look, he said, "My all my wealth is a result of a couple things, some good genes and compound interest and in living in America. So if all you do is get compound interest on your side, the game changes. You don't have a lot of money. What Ken Blanchard told me to do, that wasn't when I sold the business. I was in the business. It was requiring so much cash from me. And he was saying, no matter how much cash you have, the business will demand it. You got to take this percentage and set it aside and not give it to the business. I, you know, I had a situation at one point where I went through a divorce. I, I initiated it, but it was a brutal divorce, quite frankly. And when I married this woman, she had no money and I lived in Del Mar Castle. When I got divorced, she got an eight times multiple on my businesses. And I had to pay her a million dollars a year for 18 years. I was only married to her for 14 years, plus $42 million. So I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that I woke up every day before I could feed my own family. I had to pay this woman a million bucks and now I had to pay the taxes on it. And the only way you can do that is automate it and forget about it and add value. Put Focus on how to add value in your business. So I took it as a tax off the top. I never looked at it again. And I just automated it. And I got to be honest, the first six to 12 months, it made me a little crazy because I'm working my guts out and she's not. But what happened was after a while, it's just my skill increased. And what I found is anybody's done this in business, even the very beginning and say, Look, if the government came in right now and put a 15% additional tax on your business, you'd scream, you'd yell, you'd say, I can't pay it, and you'd F and pay it. But the difference is the compounding here is what's different. I, I try to explain compounding, like, you know, think about like uh, if you want to tell a kid this. You know, if you take a 19 year old kid who's got a little job and you say, Look, I want you, it sounds like a lot, but I want you to put aside $300 a month. But let me show you why. 300 bucks a month set aside, thrown in the market. Average market return has been 8%. It's been 10% over 100 years, but most recent, you know, 30 years, 8%. So let's say you get the average return and it compounds. That kid who starts at 19 with 300 a month can stop at 27. He's only done it for eight years, never put another dime in. And he's only put in $24,000, $28,000, but that'll grow to 1.8 million without putting another dime in. That's the power of compounding. 28 grand, 1.8 million. If his best friend starts at 27 when he quits and invests every single year all the way to 65 and he puts in the same $300 a month, he puts in 140 grand and at the end of that time, he's got $400,000 less money. So it's not the amount of money, it's the amount of time. Mm -hmm. Time is your greatest friend here. And if you get in the game, you're going to win and you need to get in the game now, not wait till your business is successful. 
how did you decide what percentage you want to allocate to investing? It's a great question. Um, if you look at what you want to have in the end, you know, you hear very often financial advisors today still use this crazy number. They'll go, well, you need like, if you make $100,000 a year, you need a million bucks. And that's the biggest lie on the planet. Um, that was for the days when you might be able to get a 10% return. I don't know what days you could do that totally secure, maybe back when the interest rates were 18%. But there's no way that you're going to get a secure environment. The whole idea is to build your money up, build your assets up, and eventually have the income take care of you for the rest of your life. The only reason you invest is for income. Income will buy you your trips. It'll put your kids through college. It'll pay for your home. It'll give you food. People think they want assets. Assets can go up and down for any period of time. So you want to put it in a secure place at some point where the income provides all you need for the rest of your life. Well, Pretty hard to do that if you're putting that in an environment where you're trying to get 10%, it's not gonna happen. So you really need 20 times your income. That's really the number that most people should be utilizing, which doesn't sound very compelling. But when you understand compounding, like you know, $300 a month for eight years turns into 1.8 million, never put another dime in, you start to go, hmm, maybe I can still win this game. We don't think geometrically. We think you know, step at a time. And the way stocks work or the way any investment works, there's compounding and the compounding is the greatest gift that we have. So, so I guess it depends on your age for how much, how well, much specifically to answer in. your question, I would do as much as you could, but I would say is 10% would be the minimum. And you ideally want to build the 15 or 20. And they did a study for people said they had no ability to invest. They had no money whatsoever. Uh, and it was done um, by this group of, of professors that were eventually nominated for a Nobel prize. And what they found was if they put a, got them put aside 3% and anyone can do 3%. And then with every additional uh, increase in salary, they put another 3% aside. Within 15 years, the average person was saving 15%. 65% were saving 19%. These are workers in middle-class America making $35,000 a year, to give you an idea. And at 19 or 20%, you become wealthy. I mean, you, you could, you'd have to screw up to not make it at that point. But if you think about it today, most people are going to retire based on actuarial statistics for no less than 20 years, some of them 30 or 35 years. Well, they only worked for 40 years. Most people did not set aside the money to make that happen. So that's why I wrote this book. I want to do something so simple. You can read it in a weekend and say, okay, here's where I'm being screwed. And I'm going to save all that money alone. That Just the savings you can make on not overpaying in fees, every 1% in fees you pay more than you should is 10 years of income you give up in retirement because of compounding. We know that compounding works on appreciation, but compounding also works on fees. So you got to understand that. And then Jacob, I walk you through it because you cannot believe the abuses that happen in the system. You talk a lot about the house and how you're betting against the house and the house always makes money. So if somebody's now listening to you and they say, okay, great, 10, 15%, 20, maybe I'm going to, I'm going to save. What's my next step? I don't get the stock market. I don't know what to do next. I'm yes. not going to give it to a mutual fund. Like what's my next step? Well, I'm glad to hear you said you weren't going to give it to a mutual fund because most people don't know that 98% of all mutual funds in any 10 year period do not even match the market. So if you're going to buy something in, in that area, you got to start out simple. You want to buy the index because it's so cheap. Um, but we're, you got to think about where do most people put their money? They put it in a 401k. That's where 90% of Americans have the largest sum of money. It's their home and their 401k and the 401k is bigger. And the problem is, you, like you said, people don't know where to go. So what I tell people, first step, Make the most important in death, uh, financial decision in your life, that you're going to pay yourself first. So there's going to be some money you're going to keep forever for you and your family, not give it to Cape Spade or to Amazon or anybody else. Here's that percentage and automate it so you don't see it. Second step is, now we got this bucket of money we're building up. Where the hell do I put it? And in that case, the most important financial decision, investment decision, I should say, is the decision of asset allocation, which is a big word for how much money do you put in low risk environments where you probably get smaller returns, but less risk? How much do you put in higher risk environments like the stock market or real estate where you have unlimited upside, but you also have unlimited downside as well? And so how do you balance that out? And the answer to the question, we walk you through in the book how to make those decisions, but here are some of the criteria. Your age, as you said, is number one, because how much time do you need before you need this money is huge. If I'm you know, in a position, let's say I got two buckets, a secure bucket, low risk, you know, low returns, uh, a risk growth bucket, more risk, more growth, or more loss. What percentage do I put like 60% secure, 40% here? Do I do 20% secure, 80% at risk? And that has to do with number one, how much time do you need? So if you need the money in five years, you can't afford to take giant risks because if you screw up, you got no room. If you're 20 years old, 
hell, you can screw up many times and still make win the game. So that's number one. Number two is what's your risk tolerance? And in the book, we have some tests for you because what people think the risk tolerance is and what it really is are two different things. We play a game in one of my seminars where I say, uh, I put some music on and say, make change with people around you. And they go, why do I go make change? And they reach in their pockets and start making change. And you know, the, it ends after one song, four or five minutes, and I go on to the next subject. And inevitably, somebody stands and goes, I want my money back. This effer over here took 100 bucks and gave me five bucks. <laughs> and, he goes, and I go, first of all, what makes you think it's your money? And I said, second of all, what makes you think the game is over? You know, and if somebody's stressed about 100 bucks and you're going to be an investor, you're going to be in trouble. So you got to know your risk tolerance. And then last, what's your access to cash flow? If you have a lot of extra access to cash flow, you've got room to take more risks. If you don't have much cash flow, you're going to have to be more selective in, in what you're going to put at risk. How important is the education side in that? Should I just be putting my money into the index and I don't have to worry about it? And it's going to go up 7 10% a year and pay super low fees versus I need to understand the actual stocks to buy if Amazon's a good buy or not. Like how much do you advise understanding the individual companies or should it just be kind of set it, forget it, buy the index, looking at it once a year, then don't worry about it? I don't think you want to just do the index because you want to have different asset classes. If you look at the best investors in the world, they all understand that they're going to be wrong. Uh, you've talked to Ray Dalio, the greatest hedge fund investor in the history of the world. Guy made a fortune in 2008 when everyone else is losing money. And what does he tell you? He says, Tony, you have to have money in each different asset class because different environments, the environments will change. No matter how smart people think they are, they're going to be wrong. And you got to structure yourself so you're able to make money no matter what. So you don't want just, you know, the index. But what you do want to do is you do not want to be probably somebody who's trying to evaluate individual stocks. That's really, a, you know, somebody who's going to try and be a trader. And in most cases, that's not going to work. Now, if you're Warren Buffett, that's a different piece. But maybe better to invest with Warren Buffett who's better at selection than you are than you trying to do it. Stock picking, nobody wins at it. The best in the world don't win. you got people that are supposed to be the best hedge fund guys on earth. And what's their track record of the last seven years? It's pathetic. They've not even matched the market, right? And so that's why you've seen this shakeup in the hedge fund industry. Because after you pay for fees, even with their brilliant minds, you end up lower than if you just own the market itself. So the answer to your question is you need to diversify. Let me give you the four things, if I may, yeah, yeah. that are the four most important things that I found. There were only things in common. I, I interviewed 50 of the smartest financial people in the world, but they all have different approaches. You know, you look at Warren Buffett, he has a very different approach than, say, Ray Dalio does, right? One's a, you know, looking at trends in the market. The other's looking at individual companies and trying to take advantage of the best possible valuations that he possibly can. So, but here's what they all agree on. Number one, and I know this sounds basic, they're obsessed with not losing money. Most investors are obsessed with trying to make money, but because they know that if I lose $100,000, you know, and I want to grow it back, I, got, I can't just go and grow at a small rate to make that happen. Let's say I lose 50% of it. I have $50,000. How, how much do I got to grow to get even? Most people say, well, you lost 50%. You got to grow 50%. They don't realize if you had $100,000, it's only worth 50 now. You got to grow 100% to get even. So the smartest investors know they're going to be wrong and they have an asset allocation. They've broken up their assets in a way that even if they're wrong, it's not going to hurt them severely. Second, this is the one that's more interesting. They all are obsessed with this idea of how do I have the least amount of risk with the most amount of return? They call it asymmetrical risk return, risk reward. And what they look at is, when I started working with Paul Tudor Jones, one of the 10 best investors in history, he had lost money for some time. He had been the most successful investor he, in the, you know, the meltdown that happened, you know, the largest stock market his, in the history meltdown that we had. We lost 20% in a day. He made 200% that year for his, his guys and made, I think if I remember right, 40% that month. I mean, this is a brilliant, brilliant guy, but here's how he does it. He doesn't invest like most investors. He doesn't say like, where can I get a nice return? He's looking for a five to one, where if he risks a dollar, he believes he'll make five. Now he's going to be wrong. He knows he's going to be wrong. So if I risk a dollar, try to make five and I'm wrong, okay, I can risk another dollar. He can risk four out of $5 and still make money, right? So it, that puts you in a very different position than most people. You know, if you look at um, somebody like uh, Richard Branson's a friend and Richard is just a genius, as you know, but what most people don't have a clue is like when he started Virgin Airlines, he only started with five airplanes, giant investments, right? These Boeing business jets. But what people don't know is he spent a year negotiating, so he had no downside. If he didn't succeed in the first three years, he negotiated a deal to give back the planes with no credit loss, nothing lost to him. So it was all upside, no downside. That's called asymmetrical risk reward. Um, Kyle Bass is a, a friend of mine. He is 
well known during the 2008 crisis because he took $20 million and turned it into $4 billion in the worst economic environment we've had in 80 years. And how did he do it? Well, I could explain the details, but he bet against real estate when everybody else was betting on it. He looked at the facts, but here's the secret. Every time he invested six cents, in order to invest, risk six cents, his upside was a dollar. So if you risk six cents, you can be wrong 15 times and still make money. Well, he wasn't wrong 15 times, thus he made two billion out of 20 million in three and a half years. So asymmetrical risk reward is what they're looking for. You can't always get a five to one or three to one, but you wanna be looking for it and you wanna think differently than the average person. Third, they're all completely obsessed with tax efficiency but not until they first have done the first two. If you just try to do something based on taxes, it's not the right investment. But if it's something where you can feel relatively certain you won't lose money, and you've set up an asset allocation that if you're wrong, you're still okay, and then you've got tremendous risk reward, small risk, big reward, then you wanna make sure it's tax efficient because as I've trained all the people who work for me, don't tell me the return, tell me the net return. Tell me after taxes, after fees, after everything, because it's very different than what people do. And so. You know, if you take a dollar and you know, you know, compounding and you double it 20 times, it's a million and 48,000. But if you just pay 33% in tax, which is less than most of what your viewers probably are, I should say more than what, less than probably what most of your viewers or listeners probably pay, most are probably more in the 50% tax range. If you think about it, that 33% taken out after 20 turns, you think, well, how much is that? It was a million and 48, you take out 33%. Well, that's only 330,000 roughly. Yeah, around 300 grand. No, 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 that math doesn't work. This is compounding. Instead of a million 48,000, if you pay 33% tax each year, you have $28,000 instead of a million and 48. So tax efficiency, baby, is huge. And then the last one is what I talked to you about from the beginning, which is every investor believes in diversification across multiple elements. In other words, you don't want to just buy real estate. You want different assets or just the index like you described. That's a disaster because there'll be times when the index will get hit and you need something to balance it out. If you're only in one place, you're going to get hurt and the pain will be so strong, you'll probably sell and then have a permanent wound or a permanent problem. You don't want that to happen. So you need diversity across different assets. You don't want just one giant piece of real estate. You want diversity within asset classes. So multiple pieces of real estate or, or owning the index is the example. You want diversification across different economies and you want diversification across time, which is what dollar cost averaging can do. So those are four things that the greatest investors on earth all do in common, even though they have different approaches to making money. I love it. I love it. Wow. We got to, got to rewind that a couple of times to really let it digest. Uh, I know we're bumping up against the clock, Tony, uh, guys who are, who are watching live replay. The book is linked up in the description below UPW. If you want to see me as well in uh, New York in November is linked up below Tony. The third link that we have in the description is about your feed America campaign. You're trying to feed a hundred million families. Do you want to just quickly talk about that for my yeah, audience? I actually fed the hundred million every year for four straight years. This year we'll hit 400 million. I, I committed to feed a billion meals. Um, over the next 10 years. So we're six years out from the billion, but I'm really pleased with it. But every book, the book has just come out in paperback, so everybody knows. So please pick it up. And if you do pick it up, 50 meals get paid for. I, I donate 100% of this book's revenues, everything, to uh, Feeding America. So, and if you want to join me and go to Feeding America, every dollar you donate, I will duplicate. Meaning uh, if you put in $100, I'll put in 100. If you put in a million, I'll put in a million, up to 4 million each year to give you an idea. So love it if you t take advantage of this, change your own life with Unshakable. You can read it in a weekend, but you'll also be helping those that are in need. Right now, we're the richest country in the world. We got 49 million people don't know where their next meal is going to come from. 17 million are children. I was one of them, so it's not a stat to me. And that's why I'm doing this. So hope people will pick up the book. I hope it'll help them touch their lives, but also they can change other lives while they're doing it. I love it. Well, we've linked all three of those things, guys, up in the description awesome. below. Tony, we've got a minute and a half left. Final message for my audience. I would just say, look, if you're, if you have a lot of entrepreneurs in your audience and I have 54 companies myself, we do about 6 billion in business, a little more than that now. And I can tell you, I had no background what uh, in business. What made me effective was that I wouldn't get involved in a business just to make money. I'm involved with a business because it's a mission. It's something that I think can change somebody's life. And whether it's something as simple as stem cell business or whether it's LAFC, a soccer team I own, uh, or whether it's a resort in Fiji, I try to do something that's gonna change their lives. And the whole focus in business is add more value. There is no other rule. If you do more for others than anybody else does in the marketplace, you'll build a brand. People get on their knees and reach behind a soda pop to get a Coca-Cola. 
even though Coke doesn't win most of the taste tests, it is the brand. You will become the brand if you can do more for others than anybody else does. And I hope that your audience, the reason they're listening to you is to figure out how to add more and more value to the marketplace. And the last thing I'll say to them since they're entrepreneurs is find who your ideal customer is and build your business around that. The customer that's gonna do the most with you, the customer that's gonna refer the most, the customer that when winter does come will still buy from you. Find out who that is and over-service them and you will have no difficulty growing your business. Tony Robbins, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, man. I'll see you in November and I really appreciate you taking the time today. Thanks for having me on. Take care, brother.